Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We'll call the uh, welcome to the Committee of the Whole meeting of Tuesday, June 9th. Just a reminder that no decisions will be made here today. There'll be recommendations that will go to Council on June 23rd. I'll call the meeting to order and ask for a motion for the adoption of the agenda, please. Councillor Yeo and Dunn. All in favor? That's passed. Uh, is there any disclosure of pecuniary interest on today's agenda? Seeing none, uh, we'll go right into deputations. Our first deputation is item 4.1, uh, deputation regarding a claim from Ms. Uh, Joan Abernathy. Is Joan online if you want to welcome her into the meeting? We'll just get her up here on the uh, Zoom. And your microphones are all tapped in as well, so you can ask questions if necessary through to the Zoom meeting. Yes? Joan, if you can hear me, if we can just ask you to unmute yourself and turn on your camera, then we can get you up on the Zoom so we can all see you. There you are. Can you hear us okay? Can you hear me okay? Okay, we can't hear you. We just need you to take your uh, mute off. If you can unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. So welcome, welcome, Joan. As you know, deputations are five minutes. We've got your correspondence. Um, so just a quick clarification I want to get from you, Ms. Abernathy, that your deputation materials frame your request as a claim. And before you begin, I want to clarify that you are not bringing a legal claim against the city in a court of law for the money and the other items you are seeking. Because if that were the case, the city's procedural bylaw prohibits a deputation to council. So I'm assuming that instead you're making a claim to our staff through the proper claims process, uh, a process which council cannot receive that claim and does not get involved in that claims process, but that you just want to make a deputation with some background information regarding that claim. So can you just clarify that before we start for me? Well, if, if I understand you correctly, um, then I would say that uh, that, is, that is right. Okay, that's all I need to know. Then uh, please proceed. And as a reminder, you got five minutes. Go ahead. Mayor Letham, councillors uh, through Mayor Letham, members of the public, my name is Joan Abernathy. Thank you for hearing my deputation today. In January of 2020, the Ontario Divisional Court heard my application for a judicial review of a decision council made in July of 2018 to terminate my two and a half year appointment to the Kawartha Lakes Municipal Heritage Committee. The court found that council acted unlawfully by denying me procedural fairness. That means it was unlawful for council to hear a complaint in secret without notifying me, providing me details or giving me any opportunity to defend myself. The complaint was false. The complainants lied to council that for two and a half years, I bullied, harassed and threatened other committee members, and that my continued tenure on the committee would pose a risk of bodily harm to the members. Had I been given an opportunity to answer that complaint, I would have produced evidence and witnesses in my defense. I believe the complaint was made to discredit me because I oppose the interests of the complainants in what some say has become a culture of fraud. A culture of fraud exists when deceit is routinely rationalized as justified if it furthers a personal or political agenda. We're all familiar with the fake news that causes so much trouble and with the financial fraud that costs Canadians $130 million per year but it is also a criminal fraud when individuals intentionally lie to counsel to influence a vote on any motion 
including a motion to destroy a colleague for political reasons. Lying to counsel to influence a vote constitutes municip municipal corruption under section 123 sub 2 of the Criminal Code of Canada. Municipal corruption hurts more than just its targeted victim. It hurts our whole community. It erodes public confidence in the integrity of council and in your ability to administer good government. I incurred damages in this matter and costs to challenge council's decision. So I have submitted to you what is a modest claim for restitution and that can be found with my contact information in the attachments to section 4.1 of today's Committee of the Whole Agenda on the City website. I did not ask for a punitive award because I believe Council's primary fault was in trusting unreliable sources and being convinced by a slick and urgent presentation that waiving the procedural fairness that has been a cornerstone of our democracy since the Magna Carta was somehow justified by the outrageous accusations before it. I believe Council has good intentions, as evidenced by the changes proposed to policies 2018, 017 and 018. But it also matters how you proceed from here. So I implore you to very carefully consider your reply to my claim, because whatever you decide, will send a message to those who have deceived counsel in the past, to those who may try to do so again in the future, and to all the residents of Kawartha Lakes who look to you all for good leadership. So please contact me if you have uh, any questions or want to discuss the, the claim with me or my deputation remarks. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Abernethy. I'll just get a motion to receive and then I'll see if any council has any questions for you. Uh, motion to receive, Councillor Dunn. Seconded by Councillor O'Reilly. Councillor Dunn, you have a question? Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, um, I have actually several questions. So, um, Joan, to date, have you ever found out what the actual complaint against you was? Like as in a specific thing on June the 3rd, 1917, you did the A, B, and C. Have you ever been given that type of information? Uh, no, Councillor Dunn, I have uh, received no specifics. Okay, now at any time have you ever found out who your accusers were? Um, no, I, I, I've, never, I've never had that confirmed. Okay, all right. Um, just a couple of questions, and it, 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 it kind of skirts around your request, because uh, I don't look at it as a claim, I look at it as being more of a request. Um, are you a lawyer? Oh, no. Are you wealthy? No. So, so the money you spent was serious money to you? It wasn't? Yes, I had to put it on my credit card. <laughs> okay, all right. And, and how much money did you spend to, uh, to fight this claim, this, this, this uh, well, action? It, it's, it's around uh, $10,000 and you know, interest is still accruing, of course. So, okay. I mean, I didn't, I didn't um, submit a, I could no, do no, that. If, no, if, no, I'm just being, I'm just being curious. Well, yeah. before I finish asking questions, I wanna congratulate you because it's very few people of modest means and I think you fall into that category that have the chutzpah to, um, to take on City Hall. And most of the time people just roll over and play dead. So I wanna thank you for what you've done and I wanna uh, congratulate you. No further questions, Mr. Mayor. Any other questions for Ms. Abernathy? Seeing none, we have a motion to receive. All in favor? That's passed. Thank you, Ms. Abernathy. We appreciate you taking the time to share your concerns with us. And, and as I mentioned before, if you're filing a claim with the city, then I urge you to do that through the proper channels and uh, we'll go from there. Thanks for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Follow-up motion, Councillor Dunn. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'll move that, uh, that this committee recommends to, uh, to council that 
council, on behalf of the city, issues an apology to, uh, to Mrs. Abernathy uh, for, uh, for this issue, for these concerns. And if I get a seconder, I'll, uh, I'll explain my rationale. Councillor Elmsley? No. Um, seconder? Councillor Yo, go ahead. Yeah, Mrs. Abernathy is, but you know, and 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 the court ruling, uh, the court ruling states it. Uh, she's gone through a very unfair process, for for whatever reason. Uh, at at this point, for me, is immaterial. Uh, the 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 process has been de uh, been determined by by divisional court, and it's only because she's had the the energy and the drive to uh, to uh, bring about uh, justice. Um, uh, that in fact she's you know she's in a position to at least be uh, uh, accommodated or recognized by the divisional court that she was treated unfairly, and I think it's appropriate for um, for this for city council to uh, to also acknowledge that and give her a letter of apology. Um, so okay, that's it. Councillor Hill, you second it. Do you want to speak to it? Yeah, Councillor Almsley, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I speak against the motion. I think council at the time acted in uh, good faith based on the information it had and that uh, until staff looks into this and does more research and comes back with a recommendation, I couldn't support a motion to issue an apology. Thank you. Any other questions, comments regarding the motion on the floor? Call it, do you want to sum up? Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Staff's already done that. Staff went to court. We sent our lawyer to court with all the information and with more information than, than Mrs. Abernathy had because our lawyer had all the information. Our lawyer was unable to defend the city's position. And the court ruled that. But we were unable to defend the position of the city. So having staff look into it again and try to come up with a reason why we did right, I think is absolutely impossible. The court's already ruled on this. And staff, with all the resources we have, compared to a lady with modest means and no lawyer, uh, the fact that she won at divisional court is quite significant to me, and I think we should apologize for what we did. Well, I could comment, but I won't. I'll call the question. Uh, everybody's clear on the motion. All in favor? Motion fails. Uh, we'll move on to Councillor Dunn. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll further move that uh, city staff um, uh, in engages with um, uh, with Mrs. Abernathy to uh, to recompense her for the money out of pocket, not the damages that are, that are listed in her, in the report, but for the money out of pocket that she spent in order to uh, to fight this claim. And She's putting a claim in with the city, so we don't get involved in that from a council I, perspective. I didn't get the impression, and it could be wrong, but from reading the report, well, I didn't. That was what she confirmed before the deputation, that she was going to put a claim in through okay, the city process. Right. So I would rec highly recommend you let that all process right. go through, okay. and no, then no. you can deal with it afterwards if the way I The way I read the report is she's saying this is what I'm going to be asking for. I didn't realize that she had actually filed a complaint. I don't know if she's filed it yet, but that's why I needed the clarification before okay. the deputation right. that she wasn't going to do litigation. It was going to be for a claim through the city, and she confirmed that she was going to go that route. All right, that's okay. fine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move into uh, our second. Well, we'll go to presentations, item five. Uh, we have a presentation, item 5.1, which is the Cobaconk Wellness Center Feasibility Report Presentation. Uh, we are going to be joined here by Jennifer Wilson, the General Manager of the Cobaconk Chamber of Commerce, and Ian Forster, the Chair of the Cobaconk Chamber of Commerce. Cobaconk and Norland Chamber of Commerce, correct? Don't want to forget Norland, I'll lose some friends up there. <laughs> Just Hello, Jennifer, everybody. Or? Can you hear me, Jennifer? So Ian is joining us. Ian, thank you, Mr. Okay, Mayor. we can hear you. Ian is Ian is Ian, well. is Ian joining you? 
He is. Okay. Is he on a separate computer or is he on there with you? He's on separately. I can see him logged in, but his microphone is off and his video too. So let's ask Ian if you can hear us to uh, unmute yourself and put your video on. There you go. The host has asked you to start your video. Start my video? There you go. Yeah, we can see something. If you want to point that to you. <laughs> Just angle that computer so that it's facing you would be... Uh, Facing camera. How's that? Nope. Technical, not a lot, whatever the word is. Technologically challenging game. I assume we're going to let Jennifer do the talking. <laughs> I think this is a There's a little camera on the top. I don't know if you're on a laptop, Ian. A little camera on the top. You just have that little dot light on the top has to be facing right at you. Yeah, it is. Right now, it's it's 90 degrees away from me, or 180 degrees away from yeah, me. Yeah, you need to just turn it around. Well, I can, if I turn around, I won't see you, but that's fine. Jesus, I love this stuff. Okay. Okay, we'll can get started. We'll go with what we have right now. Um, Jennifer, we'll turn it over to you. Um, you're going to give us a bit of presentation and, and hear what you have to say. And then we'll see if council has any questions. So uh, I'll turn it over to the both of you. Go ahead. Ian, do you want to start? Can you hear me? Yeah, no. we can hear you. Okay. Jennifer, we'll advance the slides here. So if you just give us a little uh, hand signal or whatever when you want the next slide to come up on the presentation, then we'll, uh, we'll move it forward from here, okay? Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All set? All set. Hey, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, council and staff. Thank you for the uh, opportunity to report back to you today with a feasibility report for the Cobalconk Wellness Center. This is a concept uh, we've, we discussed together more than a year ago and we thank, we thank you for the opportunity to explore the possibility further. This report is the result of more than a year of community consultation primary data collection, research on the gaps in care, site evaluations, building concept designs, and construction and operating funding models. We're very pleased to bring this report to you, and we especially would like to thank Council for providing the funds in order to make this study possible. Jennifer and I will walk you through a few of the key points in the feasibility report that were distributed to you last week, and then we'd like to be happy to answer any questions that you have. Next slide, is it? Okay, to give a brief overview of the issue in the project, there's a gap in healthcare services in the northern area of the Quartz Lakes. Although the community of Cobalconk is very grateful to have a family doctor, many residents still don't have access to one nearby. No after hours care exists in the north. The nearest hospitals are 30 to 60 miles away and their emergency departments report high levels of patients using emergency department services for non-emergencies. This is not a good trend before the COVID-19 pandemic hit and we're and looking to the future, we need to solve this issue before another similar healthcare emergency comes our way. Our objective is to find the best possible for both the community and the municipality. Our objectives guiding the study were to determine health services gaps in our community, if and how a wellness center offering primary care and allied professional care could address service gaps and increase the efficiency of the current system and a model for a wellness center based on perceived gaps and provincial trends in care. Potential services and level of interest to doctors and allied health professionals in participating in the wellness center, health services delivery model, and the feasibility of the wellness center, including the physical design of the faci facility, construction costs, and the operating costs. The vision for the wellness center is to provide quality medical and wellness services to the residents and visitors to the city of Kawartha Lakes Ward 1 by establishing a permanent wellness center on Legion Park parcel of land, including the historic Cobalconk train station, to provide a, and also to provide a hub for community health that will bring increased access to conventional medicine and allied healthcare services, as well as community organizations in an underserved geographic area. You go on the next slide. The plan for this center is to act in a 
complementary way to other healthcare providers and centers in the region. We have had a lot of interest from other healthcare agencies and providers, as well as community organizations who are excited to be part of this, i.e. Community Care, United Way, Ross Memorial Hospital, etc. Dr. Warzy and Kobakonk has expressed enthusiasm for the project and Kobe Pharmacy has expressed the desire to be located in the Wellness Center as well. We see these two as anchor partners for the new Wellness Center. As you see in the chart in this slide, uh, these are some of the services that we were looking within the feasibility study to provide and see if they were available to be prov provided and if they were needed. And uh, otherwise the slide is pretty, it, it's, uh, we found a lot of uptake from every group in, in this situation, this, uh, this chart kind of indicates that. Under the current challenge, Kobaconk Norland is the largest of the city of Corth Lakes communities in the north end of the city. It is lo located almost exactly halfway between the hospitals in Lindsay and Minden, which represents an approximate 30 minute drive to either facility. As you can realize in the winter that can increase up to an hour or more. The healthcare service offerings in the northern part of the city were undergoing considerable upheaval even before COVID-19 with certain doctors leaving and uh, uh, healthcare providers either not being available to cater to our population or the service just was not there. Now, after COVID-19, the situation has been further exasperated by things that have happened due to the pandemic. Many residents do not have access to a family doctor at this time, and with the larger than the provincial average population of seniors, this lack of access to healthcare is compounded. Our population can be described as a core of year-round residents with a large influx of seasonal residents. This is a low-income area with over 50% of the population over 50 years of age. All of these residents have a common need for good quality year-round healthcare services within an easily accessible distance of their homes. The current pandemic is having far reaching impacts, one of which is a shift in thinking for many of the seniors in our area. Many so-called snowbirds are adjusting to the new reality and rethinking their annual plans for winter. For many, the danger and uncertainty around travel means maintaining full-time residence in the area. Another shift that is taking shape is that more people are considering a move to a more rural small town setting rather than the more urban ones. During our experiences of COVID-19, we now see that a great many jobs can be done remotely away from the traditional office environment. Both of these shifts will further impact the demand for healthcare. We're really finding it within the real estate agent, uh, real estate uh, business up here that uh, they are getting an awful lot of inquiries. There's a lot more purchasers out there than properties for sale from what we've heard. And this is all based on what I just said previously, but the seniors are now saying, okay, there's uncertainty with health insurance. There's uncertainty with travel. There's uncertainty with things like cruises and stuff. We're going to stay home. And also uh, people wanting to get away from that. Uh, the grind in the city, as far as uh, having to cut down on, on your social distancing and everything, just looking at this area as the perfect place to relocate to. Now, during the study, with our site options. There were several, several sites that the community raised as possibilities for a wellness center. We conducted a quick review of each for a few key indicators, space to accommodate the building and parking, walkability, cost to acquire the land and zoning, and the possibility for future expansion. The, uh, the sites were, as you can see on the slide, the site of the former Kobokonk Medical Center, the site of the former Kobokonk School, which has now been demolished. Both those buildings have been demolished the current OPP station on Highway 48 outside of Kobokonk and uh, the Kobe train station in Legion Park property. The Kobokonk train station in Legion Park property scored highest against the evaluation criteria and is our preferred option. One of the key drivers for this decision was to also maintain that any facility still be connected to the actual uh, main artery of Highway 35, but also economically to the, uh, to the businesses in town so that it wasn't a case of having to go outside of the, the village limits to uh, locate a very important um, facility like this and also to help facilitate uh, walk-in traffic from the current occupants or well, current residents of the, of the village. 
Now, some more uh, preferred site option on this slide here demonstrates the most, the, okay, sorry, I jumped the gun. The location of the proposed center is on city owned land where the historic trade station now sits. This is a hundred acre parcel that was uh, gifted to the city of, it was gifted to, I believe, Bexley Township before um, amalgamation and then it got uh, inherited to the city through amalgamation. The uh, historic building, uh, the historic train station has been integrated into expansion plans for the wellness center design celebrating the local history. Key advantage of the site is the potential for future expansion for a retirement hub to provide retirement and assisted living facilities to serve the aging residents of our communities going forward. This has also been identified as a, uh, a key consideration for everything that we're going to do on this property. Uh, now we should be on the slide with the, that shows the actual lot, the parcel, the red circle is where the train station is now. Highway 35 is to the uh, east side and Highway 48 is to the north. And that whole area is the property in, in question. So you can see it's a pretty big area that, uh, that could do a lot of good things. Now, the, one of the biggest advantages is the city owns it. So it's not a case of land has to be purchased. Here's a, the next uh, site plan. Is a quick look at the site plan concept drawing. You'll see the original train station as the rectangular box in the bottom of the structure and a new construction to the top. It features a great improvement in the approach to the building, attractive outdoor spaces, a drop off area and lots of parking. The property itself has a beautiful pond that could be uh, made even better looking right to the, it's a very uh, peaceful and what's the word I'm looking for? A quiet area that lends itself to, uh, to medical issues, I guess you could say. And there's a lot of area to expand. Now we engaged part of our, uh, our feasibility study was we used part of the funds to engage uh, ERA Architects through a, a nonprofit subsidiary they have that specializes in finding architectural uh, renovation uh, projects within repurposed re, um, buildings within rural communities. It's what they specialize in, and they've been a huge help. With that. If you have any, if you've ever read any articles on buildings in Toronto or around the province that are being renovated from a historical point of view or incorporated into office buildings, whatever, you'll usually find that ERA is the architect of choice on this. So we're very happy to have been able to engage them. This uh, exterior view shows the view from the north. Again, this is the concept view for what uh, we're looking at now. The train station is pretty self-evident. Well, the slides I hope are showing that uh, the train station in red and the addition in white in the back. And the next slide is the south concept. So the, the kind of neat part about this is that the entrance and uh, reception area of the whole facility will be, will mimic a train, the train station uh, the way it used to run where people would come in, buy their tickets and uh, jump on the train or wait for the train. So that's going to be incorporated in the building. We did uh, as many studies as we could within the time constraints and, the, and our resources and uh, they're listed on the on this slide, site assessment slide. There, nothing was identified as any big issue that uh, we had that was throwing up a red flag. There's still some other things that have to be looked at, but uh, nothing that should um, uh, stand in the way of uh, this project moving forward. Now, again, we're, we're uh, because of the way with COVID, the way now we're getting the province to open up some areas and everything, it may change some of the timelines, but our idea is to, to get shovels in the ground by March of this year coming. So that's, uh, sorry. Oh, somebody talked. Uh, we're anticipating that it should take about 14 months to complete the project. Now the costs that are, uh, that are listed there are going to be subject to, uh, to value engineering and other uh, 
considerations once we get down to detailed designs and a few other constraints are met. So we're anticipating uh, that this is going to be uh, cheaper than, than what is listed here. We're hoping that anyway. Now on the funding model, uh, we're looking at all three levels of government through either uh, soft costs or, or hard dollars to participate in this project. And the community is very excited about getting behind this, getting ready to fundraise. And we're committed to, to raise in the neighborhood of a million dollars, depending on the final budget and what we can get from other uh, levels of government that uh, th we really wanna make this a community project. So, and we're finding the commitments there. They're just, everybody's chomping at the bit to get going. Any project needs uh, local engagement, energy, and partnership. We have that in our project. Uh, we've engaged 25 stakeholder groups and uh, Corinth Lakes Healthcare Initiative has been a huge help and a huge partner in this. And uh, they're looking to be a, a partner going forward as well. As far as alignment with, uh, with local priorities, it, the need for this project is not only reflecting the statistics and voice of the community, but in the priorities set by council strategic plan for 2023. Uh, with respect to goal one, a vibrant and growing economy. Goal two, an acceptable quality of life. And goal four, good government. Uh, economic impact of having a doctor in the community. There is no question that the creation of a wellness center in Covaconk will spur further economic growth in the city of Corth Lakes. The Corth Lakes Healthcare Initiative, responsible for the recruitment and retention of doctors in the area, estimates approximately five hundred thousand to a million dollars in economic development per year per physician physician in a community. That does not take into account the quick economic surge that will result in the construction of the wellness center, and the allied health professionals that will be part of the project long term. Quality healthcare is a foundational piece of any economic growth plan for the area. Uh, we're looking at, um, when we talk about other, other people that are interested in the building, it's service, uh, service companies such as Medigas, such as uh, uh, lab testing, such as support, uh, you know, uh, support companies that, that supply medical supplies and services. They're all looking at this saying, this is a great place for us to locate because it cuts down the travel from our areas we are now and it provides a, they also recognize that I believe that the, the market up here is gonna be changing for the better for them as well. Given the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Wellness Center project represents a key opportunity to spark economic activity and prosperity in Corth Lakes, both short-term construction jobs and long-term quality year-round jobs. Overall, there are many benefits that will emerge through the construction of a wellness center in Kobaconk. Most significant are these. An innovative, well-designed facility that will attract doctors and practitioners to serve the needs of permanent and seasonal residents in the northern area of Kawartha Lakes, a, min a Ministry of Health designated underserviced area. The wellness center will be part of a long-term long post-COVID-19 strategy to ensure that the strain of dealing with non-emergencies in our local emergency department is alleviated allowing emergency departments to focus on the pandemic and emergencies. The Wellness Center will serve as a lever to significant economic development in the area, benefiting local business, residents, tourists, and the municipality. In summary, overall, this feasibility study presents the background research and conclusions needed to move this project forward. In brief, there is a demonstrated gap in care and there is a need for a Wellness Center to serve the current and future populations. The closest, excuse me, the closest emergency department usage statistics show that many are using emergency services as a substitute for primary care. We need to improve local access for healthcare services as soon as possible. So emergency departments are available for emergencies, especially when we're faced with pandemic. Right now, um, if people have to do their, get their, um, their blood tests for you know, whatever reason uh, and go for dialysis, even things like uh, foot care, uh, very specific senior issues that, that uh, have to be dealt with, they're finding that they have to travel a great distance to go to these things. If we had something local, it would be a huge plus for the area and it would allow people to, um, 
to live in their in their homes or cottages year round and not worry about uh, having to travel, not worry about whether they can get the service or not. And as it was put to us um, most eloquently by um, our mayor, that if I can quote him, if that's okay with him, this is a city of Kawartha Lakes project because whatever we do up here will take pressure off of the other services in the other areas of the city. The more we can do to relieve, relieve the pressure that's on Ross, then uh, the, the better it'll be for the whole city. And it goes for the North, uh, Minden as well, because right now um, Minden is also our flow out um, emergency uh, facility for the people that are up in the North part of the city. So it's a, it's not a, it, it's not a local issue. This is a citywide issue that we're trying to help solve locally. Land acquisition is a substantial cost to any project. The Lindsay Car Park parcel is uh, owned by the city and is currently underutilized. Services such as access, sewage disposal, and hydro are readily available to the site. The refurbishment of the, refurbish, refurbishment of the historic train station building will give new purpose and profile to one of the main historic buildings in the community. With several studies and architectural drawings completed as part of the feasibility study, the construction of the wellness center shall be shovel ready within a short period of time. This project will serve as a lever to economic recovery in the area by providing much needed jobs at a crucial time for this hard hit region of the province. The overall preliminary budget, as we said earlier, is approximately 6 million. We hope to find some cost savings as we move the project forward. The communities behind the project and subject to funding from all three levels of government is willing to commit to raise at least $1 million. In summary as well, the Wellness Centre project is an opportunity for all levels of government to collaborate, to bring much needed services together in one place, to help attract new family doctors to the area and to be a lever for new and critical economic growth. The chamber and local community are committed to providing the energy required and we hope council is committed to it as well. Thank you for your time. And I'd also like to thank staff for helping us put this, uh, this whole report together. They've been a huge help and uh, going forward, we're looking forward to working with them farther uh, in the future. So um, if we, if you have any questions, uh, we'd be glad to take them now, please. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Well done. Uh, summarizes things nicely. I'll just see if council has any questions. Councilor Yo, go ahead. Did you want a motion to receive first? Or? Ask the, let's do questions and then I think we'll do receive and a refer to staff for report back so we get it in time for, for any budget consideration. So are there any questions ahead of time? Yeah, I just um, wondered if um, Ian or Jen wanted just to touch on the public consultation part of it a bit more um, and talk about the meetings we had and the, uh, and the way the public perceived the project. Jen? Sure, so we held three community meetings that were attended by more than 150 people over the last year or so um, in order to test the need and the interest in a wellness center facility in the area and to understand what services were needed from the community's perspective. Um, we heard from more than 450 people. In addition to those meetings, we heard from four, more than 450 people in the online and written community health needs survey that were circulated earlier this year in our wider area uh, to hear their thoughts as well. And uh, we mentioned also engaging with more than 25 stakeholder groups uh, throughout the process as well. Um, there's, a, there's a list of who those key stakeholders in the, in the, wide, in the larger report. Um, but, uh, you know, it goes without saying that the Cobaconk Railway Station Restoration Committee is part of that, the Cobaconk Medical Centre Trust, also a key partner there, and the Kawartha Lakes Healthcare Initiative. Um, the cottage associations are, have all been involved, the churches in the area, the seniors groups, the historical society, the service clubs, um, not to mention um, several different departments within uh, the city of Kawartha Lakes and the municipality as well have shown um, so much uh, care and input into what we're trying to do here. It's been, it's been wonderful. We also did a bit of a best practices tour to a bunch of other medical facilities in the area to learn from their experience 
and um, discuss the possibility of future partnerships as well. And so that included um, the Omimi Medical Center, uh, the Kawartha North Family Health Team in Fenlon, the Kawartha Lakes Family Health Team, uh, one of their Lindsay locations, the Woodville Medical Center, and um, in Lakefield, the Morton Community Health Care Center as well. So that I think that, does that help give you an understanding of, a better understanding of um, the consultation that we've taken? Yeah, that's great. I just wanted to highlight that because I know a lot of time and effort was put into it and a lot of input was taken in from uh, from the public. And um, of course, the big question we've talked about is you can build it, so how do you, how do you get doctors to come? And that's the million dollar question in this case. We've, um, we've consulted with the, with the, I get these names all mixed up, but the, the, the reten doctor recruitment and retention people, they've assured us that um, the model that we're looking at as far as uh, having multiple doctors within the building is something that is in need. Uh, they're, they're finding that especially new graduates and younger doctors are coming out of school and get starting their practice they are more comfortable starting it in a group environment than on their own. So that uh, they're, I mean, let's face it, they don't lo learn uh, a lot of business rules and everything while they're doing their medical um, training. So there, it's a little bit, uh, uh, what do you call it? It, it? It's daunting facing them to go set up a practice by themselves. There's cost, there's everything. So they figured that the way the model that we're looking at now is perfect. They can be, have a really not easy, but easier time recruiting doctors when they can go in with a, a mentor like a Dr. Warsey or, um, you know, someone else in, in the situation where they can, if they have a problem, they have someone to talk to. They aren't out on an island by themselves. And they said that that is one of the, the most attractive um, parts of this plan. The other part is that if we have all these services within the building that are easily accessible, for the community, it makes it a lot easier on the doctor too. So um, it's just more things at his fingertips, better, quicker results. Everything uh, just flows a little bit better. So uh, we're right now. We basically we were told build it and they will come. Thank you, Councillor Riley. Go ahead. Yes, thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. Just a couple questions. Um, I realize this is the preferred option. That's what I'm working towards. Was there any update uh, th uh, from the uh, police station? The view through uh, Minister Scott, uh, I realized that the OPP have cl are not going to be there anymore. So I just wonder if there was any further update on that. Uh, the only notice we got uh, regarding the OPP station was that they were moving out of it. And I don't know if it's been declared surplus at this point or not. Um, I don't know if it takes that provincial process takes a while, but uh, I think for other reasons, than just availability, you know, they feel this is a better in-town location than a little bit more accessible than the OPP station. But it was, it was, I know, part of the the discussion at the beginning. I read the report, and I know in-town is a lot more uh, makes more sense for them. I just wonder, uh, is there any update, uh, maybe through Ian or to the uh, to Dan uh, from the any the federal provincial? Have they expressed any interest? Is that too early to suggest the? that uh, they are going to be willing participants or uh, is there any update on that, I guess would be the question. Our, our, so far we've, um, I've had, I had a few discussions with, with Minister Scott and the feedback that we're getting from that level is that everything has to come through the municipality. So I guess one of the things that we're looking for the, for council to um, help us with is uh, support on these programs that are coming from the different levels of government. Like the, if council um, was incumbent on, on giving us either backing or approval, I don't know what the proper uh, way to do it would be support, then we, we may not be able to go, but the council may be able to go to these things, or we, you can use you guys as a backstop to go after the government's for funding through these other programs. There's been a couple of programs that have come out lately that almost seem to uh, fall right that we fall right into, but we need access to them. So um, I guess uh, a buy-in from the city is what we're kind of after right now. Thank you. Any further questions for uh, presenters? Uh, I have a quick one. Uh, you just, your one option is the $6 million cost to build. 
Is that just the build cost or does that include the price of the land? Like when you did an estimate of cost, is that including the land value or is that strictly for building the facility? Strictly for building the facility. Thank you. Um, are there any further questions? Seeing none, can I suggest, uh, Councillor Yo, a motion to receive the presentation and um, the study and the refer to staff the draft study uh, with a recommendation to come back by the end of Q3 uh, with, with different options to, to move forward. And maybe that gives us lots of time for any budget discussions for, for the fall. And that gives staff time to sort of get their head around the whole thing and how, how we can move forward with it. Do we, you, uh, you okay with that motion? I am okay with that motion. And um, I think it speaks to, to um, support that we've given in the past. And, and it speaks to getting it back in time for budget uh, formation at the end of Q3, and it gives the community the chance to go ahead and start um, a fundraising drive and stuff now. So you'll move that? I'll move that. Thank you. You'll second that. Councillor Seymour Fagan, thank you. Do you want to speak to it, Councillor Yo? Um, briefly, I, I want to thank the folks for coming on today. The, um, it's a great project. It's got great community buy-in. It, uh, it is a small investment in the future of um, the city of Quartha Lakes. And um, it's, it's along the same lines as the price of, of building a new park these days. So it's, so it's, not, a, it's not a realm of possibilities. So I, I look forward to the report coming back and I look forward to, to helping the community move forward with it and uh, start the fundraising programs now and, uh, and look forward to staff's report coming back in the fall. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Seymour Fagan, you second it. Do you want to speak to it? Um, I guess ditto. Yeah, you covered it all, Councillor. <laughs> yeah. That was an easy out. Um, I'll just add my support. I think the work that you've done is is you know sp speaks for itself. Uh, I, I will say I, I I don't know where I saw it, but I saw somewhere that you had a vision, and in your vision you mentioned Ward One, and I really. I say it as a compliment, but don't sell yourself short. And I know Ian mentioned it before. This isn't just about Ward 1. This is, this is a, a project that will benefit the whole community. And when you're fundraising and you're applying to these programs for different grants and doctors, and you know, I think it's important that we talk. We all talk about this as a benefit for the city as a whole. It's not just about the North. It's not just about Ward 1. I know it's great for the community. We're, we're proposing it be located there, but I think overall, when we look at the benefit this will have, it'll go far beyond uh, you know, that, that scope of award one. So my friendly recommendation would be to, you know, don't sell yourself short on that. I think a lot of people are gonna be excited about this. And when you start fundraising, the wider you can cast that net uh, for people that are gonna benefit, the, the, the more we'll all benefit from that in the community. So thanks for putting this together. Appreciate all the hard work you've done. Um, any further comments regarding the proposal? We have the motion on the floor. I'll call the question. All in flavor? favor? Uh, that's passed unanimously. Thanks, folks, for coming in, and I uh, appreciate the time you've done, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Okay, our next presenter presentation is our very own Jennifer Stover here in person, Director of Corporate Services, who's gonna give us a financial update on our, a presentation on our financial update. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Latham, and it's good to see everybody's face again. Um, so I have a presentation that's gonna cover three years. Uh, sometimes I get confused and that's why. We've got three years on the go upstairs uh, in Corporate Services. So we're still working through the 2019 year end surplus, and I can speak about that. Uh, the 2020 cash flow uh, and budget, what's happening with that in light of the pandemic. Uh, the long range financial plan, we'll give an update on the status of that, and then where things are heading for the 2021 budget. So starting with the 2019 year end, uh, typically we would be coming to council at this point in time to give an update on what our audit has looked like, what the year end surplus is, Unfortunately, with the pandemic, we had to delay the audit. So the audit started the beginning of June this year, and that's being done remotely. Uh, so we would anticipate having financial statements completed over the summer, and we'll present those to council in September. Uh, but just uh, as a heads up, our preliminary results are indicating about a $3 million surplus. That's primarily stemming from two things. 
Uh, on the operations side, amongst the nine different departments, we have a net surplus of about 1.2 million. That includes a $2.6 million uh, overage on the winter control budget. Thankfully, we were able to largely offset that within the roads operations budget, so the net impact was only about 300,000. Uh, and then in corporate items, uh, is there's about a $1.8 million surplus. And really, corporate items is all those things that aren't attached to a department, they're not operational in nature. Um, that's comprised mostly of about 600,000 in interest and penalties and interest from taxes that we received. So a combination there. There's about 600,000 that's stemming from accounting adjustments we have to do uh, to be in compliance with PSAP. Uh, and then 400,000 is the uh, additional funds that we received from OMPF. Those will get transferred off to reserves. So although we have a $3 million surplus, it's a nice large number. At this point, we're not making any recommendations on what to do with those funds for two reasons. We wanna make sure the audit's complete uh, and that we haven't missed anything. Uh, and then second, we do have the pandemic happening and it is having an impact on our finances. Uh, there's lots of uncertainty. We don't know what's happening still. Uh, so we'd like to wait until uh, the 2020 budget uh, is we can see what's happening with the 2020 budget and then we'll come forward with some recommendations uh, on what's happening with what to do with our surplus. So moving on, uh, getting into 2020, uh, there's a few things that we've had to do. We're going to talk about a ca our cash flow and our budget. So a budget, as you know, uh, council gets involved in every year is really that uh, annual exercise where we forecast our costs and then determine how we're going to pay for that. We match it with revenue so that everything's balanced. The cash flow is a little bit different in that we're looking at what money's coming in the door and making sure that we've got sufficient funds to cover our costs. Uh, and so that cash flow really became necessary this year uh, because property taxes are our most significant source of revenue. Uh, and we made the decision to defer property taxes by 60 days, which meant we had a significant amount of cash being deferred 60 days as well. Um, so we, as it says there, we've made that decision to also defer the final tax bills by 60 days. So instead of the money typically coming in in June and September, this year it'll come in in August and November. And I think you've seen uh, this slide before. You can tell but the blue bars represent the tax revenue that comes in uh, each month in 2019 and then in the orange bars represent 2020. So you can see that shift uh, in June and September being pushed out to August and November and then an increase uh, in June for property taxes. You might wonder why the June bar isn't a little bigger since we've deferred property taxes uh, to that date. We're happy to report that about 50% of our residents paid their property taxes in April even though we made the deferral. So that was uh, a nice surprise for us. Uh, and greatly appreciated. So some assumptions that we've made in the cash flow, so again, that deferral of property taxes that I just talked about. We've also assumed uh, a greater than usual delinquency rate. So we do have some residents that struggle to pay their taxes on an annual basis. We've assumed that number will increase for this year, uh, and we're monitoring that closely. So we're gonna see what happens with the June due date, uh, and that may impact what happens with our cash flow uh, for the balance of the year, but we hope that we have been conservative enough uh, to capture that. There's also the lost revenue due to facility closures and cancelled programming. That's our most significant cost to date related to the pandemic. Uh, we've curbed non-essential spending, so things like training, uh, meeting expenses, we've cancelled all of that for all staff, so we're seeing some savings through there. Office supplies are being saved because we don't have staff in the building, things of that nature. So we've reduced costs where we could. Um, and then we've also factored in uh, that we've we're going to be receiving the federal gas tax uh, money in one lump sum this year in July rather than over two payments. So we've assumed that acceleration as well. So this just gives you a graphic to help uh, explain why we've had some pressures. So in the top left is 2019. The blue bar represents what our revenue looks, our revenue stream looks like. Uh, for each month and then the orange bar is representing our expenses so you can see that our our revenues the money that we've got coming in the door is always higher than what we're spending and you can see in 2020 
uh, those lines are very close. Uh, and just because of the magnitude of the numbers, what you're not seeing is that there are some opportunities where our expenses actually exceed uh, the money that we have in the bank to pay. Uh, so on that note, in April, we actually drew $10 million out of investments, uh, and that was to ensure that we had sufficient funds to, to keep the city going. Uh, and currently, our cash flow shows that we're going to need to draw probably another $5 million uh, in late October. So again, that will depend on what that tax revenue looks like as it comes in. And I just want to make sure we're clear between budget and cash flow. This doesn't mean that we can't afford to keep the city going. Uh, we do ba pass a balanced budget every year, so we know that the money is there. It's just a timing issue of when the money is going to come in. So that's what this uh, cash flow exercise is looking at. Um, and so it's really just making sure we've got that money in the bank to pay for operations, but that money will come in down the road. So it's just, just a timing exercise, but wanted to make you aware of it. Um, on the capital side, uh, we have also had to, we've gone through the exercise of understanding when capital projects are going to happen uh, and the special project budget. We factored that into the cash flow as well. So it's all encompassing um, and wanted to turn your attention to the report that's next on the agenda. There's four attachments to that report, four appendices. Um, so Appendix A is the list of all the capital projects that we're currently working on. These are projects that had either started prior to the pandemic or we were able to uh, commence and keep going through the pandemic. Uh, Appendix B is a list of capital projects that we had to defer to 2020, the fall of 2020. Um, and that really wasn't, uh, it wasn't financially related. It was a matter of resources. We were focusing on the pandemic. They got pushed off. They're going to start in the fall. Appendix C uh, is likely the list you might be most interested in. That's the list of capital projects that we've deferred to 2021. So we just, we don't have the capacity to get those projects started right now, or it made sense to push them off. And so those projects will start in 2021. And then Appendix D is the special project. So that was the new budget we passed for 2020. Uh, it's broken out into those same three categories, uh, but because the list is shorter, we've just left it as, as one appendices. Um, so then the 2020 budget, if we flip back to what happens with budget, um, this is where we're trying to determine uh, whether at year end we'll be in a surplus or deficit position. So we know that the pandemic costs to date, we're running at about $3.2 million. Those costs uh, may increase if recreation and programming and facilities don't resume. We have already built into that $3.2 million some assumptions that Arena revenue, as an example, won't be as high as it typically would be in a normal year. Um, and just to speak to the speed of how things happen, I put this presentation together over the weekend, and as of yesterday, some of these things are already changing and starting to happen, so uh, it's a bit out of date. Um, and then just the final comment on the 2020 budget to date, there's been no federal or provincial funding announcements that have been made to help support us in those costs. Um, so we are looking to reduce the 2020 budget to offset those uh, pandemic-related costs and lost revenues. Uh, we're going through that exercise currently, and we're doing, in doing that, uh, we do anticipate that there will be some service level impacts. Uh, we're looking at how can we do service different? Um, can we uh, not do some services with no impact? Can we reduce services? Um, or just change the way we deliver them. And that's uh, both from a safety perspective, so making sure staff and residents are safe, um, and to ensure there's financial sustainability within the city. And to put that in just in a simple example that uh, everybody would be able to relate to, if we look at grass cutting, it seems like a simple exercise, uh, but prior to COVID, we would put four people in a truck, the trailer on the back, we'd drive them to a park, because of physical distancing, we can no longer put four people in a vehicle. Uh, so we now have to put two people in a vehicle with an engineered barrier in between the front and back seat. Uh, so to get those four people to a park to maintain that level of service, now we need more trucks or we have to have staff driving their own vehicles. There becomes expenses associated with that. Um, and so these are, this is just a simple example of an activity that seems relatively easy to uh, undertake 
there's a lot of uh, precautions that we need to put in place, a lot of processes that we need to think through. Um, and so that's, you know, similarly, the province opened up uh, pools yesterday. Now we have to think about how does, how, what does that look like? How do we provide those services to make sure our residents and staff are safe um, and make sure that it's financially sta uh, sustainable to, to proceed with? So then moving on, our long-range financial plan, uh, we actually had uh, that close to completion and we're ready to present to council in Q2. The pandemic hit. Uh, a lot of our assumptions uh, sort of went up in the air and so we're now proposing that we'll delay that until uh, after the budget's approved for 2021 because we want to make sure we're, we were able to capture the full impact of the pandemic and provide council with any recommendations on any financial recovery that's required. Um, and again, that we need to really look at uh, this as the need to assess affordability of our services. So that'll tie into the exercise we're doing uh, as part of getting costs down for the 2020 budget as well. And then the final uh, piece, we've gone through 2019 and 2020, we can move on to 2021. Uh, our 2021 budget, again, typically we would have already started from a staff perspective. We would have started the 2021 budget already. Uh, we're not in a position to do that right yet. Uh, so we're going to postpone the budget deliberations uh, with the intent of having the budget passed in Q1 of 2021. So we'd operate it similar to an election year. So the schedule uh, with the dates that are important uh, for council Again, staff are starting that review right now of the 2021 budget, uh, but in Q4, you can anticipate uh, that we will be coming to council looking for you to have some input on the capital program, looking for you to uh, advise us of projects that you'd like to complete. You can have that discussion. Uh, the agencies and boards will be asked to submit their budgets, and we would anticipate having the proposed budget binder out to you for review uh, over the holidays. Uh, if you choose, but we'll hope to have that out before the end of the year. And then in Q1 of 2021, uh, we'll have the agencies and boards come to council to do their full presentation, and we would have the deliberations with the intent of having the 2021 budget approved uh, before the end of Q1. And that's it. Thank you. We'll get a motion to receive the presentation, uh, Councillor Dunn and Elmsley, and we'll see if there's any questions. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Dunn. Yeah, just one question on um, on Appendix C. Uh, so those products or those projects are currently funded, and we anticipate so they're funded under 2020, and although they'll be completed in 2021, they'll be paid for out of the 2020 budget. Through the mayor, you are correct. So they are part of the 2021 for the 2020 budget. They're fully funded. Okay. Uh, it's just a matter of didn't have the resources uh, to get to those projects this year. Okay, so do we anticipate as we, uh, as we review our financial situation, any of those projects being uh, deleted or do we anticipate that those projects will continue to be um, uh, funded in 2021? Uh, through the mayor, since uh, Cap council has approved that budget, we would anticipate that those projects would continue on uh, unless we were advised otherwise. Thank you, Councillor Almsley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Notice I didn't stand up. Um, I believe we have a procedural bylaw that says that the budget must be passed in the, pre in the year previous to when it is uh, going to be spent. In other words, uh, we need to pass a budget in 2024, 2021. Do we therefore have to um, waive that bylaw or do something in order to not be in violation of our own rules? I think, I think you're correct. I'll refer to the clerk, but I think we do have a procedural bylaw, and if we do, we'll check, and if we do, we'll bring forward before then to amend it to allow us to carry over to 2021. Thanks for that. Yeah, I, I just wanted to make sure we got that out so we didn't uh, run afoul of anything. Um, thank you, Jennifer, for the update. Um, it, uh, we're, a lot of things are going to be wait and see 
and uh, I'm glad you addressed the, the issue of uh, not seeing any funding from upper levels of government. And of course, my big concern with the deficits they're running is what we're going to see next year. And I think it's wise that we uh, keep as much money as we can in our reserves in order to smooth out that, uh, that bump because I think we know that in the past, one of the ways that both the feds and the province have uh, balanced their budget is by downloading, and uh, I think we'll be wise to have some money in reserve to, to take care of that. Um, you know, there are, there are things in the, the deferred ones that uh, we could argue whether they should be brought forward or not. Um, uh, the only one that, that really stands out to me is I think uh, there are a couple of projects at the airport that have been deferred to 2021 and I'm wondering if uh, that's a good thing to do from the point of view, um, will we be uh, waiving some revenues that we could have gotten from increased use in the airport if we don't go ahead with those projects? And I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah, and, and I'll just, we have a report that follows this presentation where we have the different schedules for deferred and everything else. So I'll just ask any of those, you know, we can have a discussion about that. Let's do that when we get to the report. Uh, I just focus these questions right now on if there's anything to do with the presentation, any questions on that. And then the report follows through with those different A, B, C, and, and, and D. But uh, I think what you're referring to is capital projects. So I'm not sure it's a big change to any sources of revenue regarding fuel or anything, but uh, we can talk about that when we get there. Uh, are there any, are you okay with that? Is that it? Thank you. Councilor Riley, you had a question? Yeah, first of all, I'd like to just thank uh, Ron and senior staff for the work they've done to, uh, to get here to this point because I think the, they've certainly put, uh, and the other directors, there's been some, uh, I won't say pressure, but uh, encouragement to come in with, uh, you know, with, with a reduced budget, and I think uh, it, it's certainly going to serve us well going forward. Um, and hopefully I'm more optimistic. I think uh, that we may, there may be some uh, money coming uh, for a second round of gas tax, but we can't count on that. And uh, I know that the uh, British Columbia, for example, they've decided that you can run a deficit. And I'm not suggesting this government's going to do or whatever, but it may be a consideration. They've moved a, a motion as well. So I think with the new quantitative easing, I think will be really good going forward. Is that a question or just a comment? Yeah, no, and no, I, yeah, and I agree. And I, and I think I, I will say that the government is uh, is considering. I know for a fact uh, allowing municipalities to run a deficit for 2020, 2021. I don't think they've decided. Uh, I'm not sure that's a good thing or a bad thing. You run a deficit, you still have to pay it back at some point. So um, the further we can keep ahead of it, the better. So I think we're we're on a good path here. But uh, Councillor Ashmore, you had a question. Yeah, yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, I have a couple questions through you to Director Stover. Thank you for the presentation. Um, just going back to two weeks ago when we had our special council meeting, there were shovel-ready design projects, and I'll just read them, not in any particular order, but this is the order that they were in. Mills, Mill Pond Bridge, Hartley Road Bridge, Valley Duff Road Bridge, Cameron Road, Canal Street, Downtown Lindsay, Phase 4. So these, these were shovel-ready projects. Are they going to be... Which appendix, I didn't see them in the appendix, either one of those three appendixes or four, uh, are they still in the queue for the latter part of this year because of their, I, I can, their shovel ready? Do you want me to? I, I think what you're referring to, Councillor, um, is the we looked for uh, infrastructure projects through the economic recovery right, on any projects that were shovel ready that weren't approved in the budget. But if we got extra infrastructure money, we wanted a list of projects to come forward that we could possibly jump on earlier if suddenly the government said, here's an extra $5 million, do you have any shovel ready project? The projects you're listing were not approved in the 2020 budget, but they're shovel ready. The studies have been done, so they're ready to go for next year or whenever they can fit into a future budget. So they were just brought forward to show that 
Uh, if we suddenly got $20 million, we could probably do that whole list starting in this fall because they're actually ready to go. But they're not approved in the 2020 budget, and I assume over 2021 they'll start coming forward uh, for approval in the capital budget. But that's, that's what that list was. Okay. Um, next question is, um, our Office of Strategy Management, we've done a lot of savings there. Like, I think it's close to it's $3 million at least. Would some of those monies be brought into the operating to help us in our operating or our capital? I assume our operating uh, money that we need right now, have we been tapping into that, the monies that we've saved through the, the OSM? CAO? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so yeah, all of those savings, they're really department driven, facilitated by OSM. Um, they fall to the bottom line year over year in those operating departments, and then we adjust the budgets in future years. And so that work hasn't uh, ceased. Um, you probably remember uh, pre-pandemic, I did a long update on uh, modernization reviews and different service reviews that we were doing, for example. That group is still uh, focused on supporting um, departments in those reviews, and any savings or service adjustments that come out of those uh, whether they're internal or council directed, then again, we just adjust the budget uh, in subsequent years. But uh, we're constantly sort of working through that group and really all departments, to be fair, uh, on finding those efficiencies and savings. Okay, thank you. And just one last question. Um, last year, I, I brought forth a motion and it was passed by council for finance staff to look at alternative uh, sources of funding. I, I know it's not due till the end of the year, but um, is that's something that we're still looking at and you know when we come into a situation like this where we're really in a crunch and we've got a an emergency situation which we're still in temporarily but hopefully out of it soon but those that's the time when you really need to tap into a, um, a program or at least at least have a, a another method of raising capital and and money for the corporation is that something that's that's going to be It'll be a report coming, I think it's the end of the year or the first of the next. And also just just as a side to that one there, that you mentioned $10 million was, was withdrawn. Was that, a, was that approved by council or was that a staff decision to take that $10 million to use that as an emergency? So the, the, the city has lots of money, uh, but the, we invest the money that we're not using day to day because we can get higher levels of interest and those decisions on investments are made by the treasurer. And so the treasurer simply withdrew investments uh, to ensure that we had sufficient funds in the bank uh, to pay the bills. And those are decisions that uh, the treasurer has the authority to do. It doesn't, it's not run by the mayor, uh, something like that. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> $10 million? No, I, I, and just, I wanted to ask the question too. So just for clarity, like when you say from our, and I think it's what you're talking about, Councillor, that when we say we've tap or we will tap into 15 million investments from a cash flow perspective. So we have these investments where we put them when we're not utilizing the money. We've, we've taken money out to help with the cash flow, but the idea if we balance by the end of the year, that money will have gone back into those investments as more revenue comes in from taxation in the city, correct? So it's really just a a flow through a temporary use of our investments, but the idea would be by the end of the, it's not an increase in debt or anything. I just wanna make sure that that's clear. Correct, so if you think about uh, in your own personal banking, you might have a savings account and a checking account and your savings account where you put money away because you wanna buy a new car, or go on a trip or whatever, and you have your checking account that you're dealing with your day to day, paying your bills to your hydro bill and your heat bill and all the rest of it. It's, it's similar with the city. So we have a bank account that we fund our day-to-day -day operations, our payroll and pay all of our bills. And we have a investments, which is really our savings account. Uh, we've got reserves that have balances in them that would represent uh, what's going into investments. So we simply borrowed that money temporarily to keep operations going and to the mayor's point on the assumption that we come out nor as per usual uh, in a surplus at the end of the year, then those monies would all be back into the investment as they would have been otherwise. It's just a timing matter. And the councillor asked about the f other funding programs or report by the end of the year. Can you comment on that? Sure. So we, um, we have a shell of a report ready to go. Uh, I believe the intent was to look at whether the city could issue bonds. It is something that we can do. 
Uh, it's not something we can easily do. We have to go through a process of getting a credit rating, things of that nature. Um, and we likely would find that the, um, the cost that we can borrow funds uh, through IO, Investment on uh, Infrastructure Ontario, or through the bank is cheaper currently than what we would have to pay out in, in shares if, or in bonds if we were to go that route, but we'll bring forward a report on that. Perfect, thank you. Okay, Councillor. Um, Councillor Dunn, you have a follow-up, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just one quick comment on the airport. Uh, uh, some of those projects are, are purposely um, um, uh, multi-year because they're, they're big ticket items and uh, in, in some years we just don't plan on doing anything with that money so the next year we have enough money in the bank to actually do it and we just put it in two different budgets. I do remember that now. Thanks for the clarification. Councillor Elmsley, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just uh, a couple of things. Um, you saw that mortgage rates are down to 1.99 percent uh, so uh, interest rates are historically low if we want to do something along those lines but what I wanted to ask is would it be possible to get printed copies of the appendixes to your report please absolutely thank you thank you any further questions regarding the presentation just a motion to receive I'll call the question all in favor that's passed thank you uh, while we got Jennifer here we'll or Director Stover, sorry. Uh, 521 is the report that the financial update be received and that this recommendation be brought forward to council for consideration at the next regular council meeting. Um, Councillor Yo, you'll move that. Second, Councillor Seymour Fagan. Are there any questions on the actual report or any of the appendices that go with it? What's being deferred? What's being suggested? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor? That's passed. Thank you. Uh, we'll move down to consent matters. Thanks, Director Stover, for your financial update there. Uh, item 6.1.1 is the proposed Old Mill Area Heritage Conservation District Study. Uh, do we have Ms. Turner, our Heritage Officer, on, uh, on Zoom that she can give us a quick two minute? Hello, Emily, how are you? She's going to give us a quick, afternoon, if sorry. you'll give us a quick, thank you. If you'll give us a quick two minute overview on this report, we'll see if council has any questions. Please go ahead. Yeah, for sure. So this report is a request to initiate a heritage conservation district study in the old mill area neighborhood of Lindsay. Um, so geographically, that's the area bounded by Lindsay Street South, Durham Street uh, West, and then also, sorry, Durham Street East, and then the Scugog River, which is on the north and the east sides. Um, so under the Ontario Heritage Act, um, a heritage conservation district study has to be initiated by council. So this is the report to um, have council, request the council initiate that and get it going. Um, the request for this was first made actually by the public. Um, so this is a public request for a study um, and it was first made in a deputation of council in May, 2018. Um, and at that time, council referred the matter back to staff for a report. Um, so this is the report coming out of that, um, out of that deputation. Um, and it also fall, also following that deputation, a petition from the community came forward to start a conservation district study in that area to assess whether or not the neighborhood could be designated as a potential heritage conservation district. Um, so the request has been reviewed both by the Municipal Heritage Committee and by staff, um, both of whom feel that doing a study in the area is warranted because of the high concentration of historic properties there. Um, so initiating this study doesn't commit council to designating the area as a future heritage conservation district. Um, but what it does is it provides um, the necessary historic background, a character analysis of the area, um, necessary policies that might need to be put in place and also recommends potential heritage conservation district boundaries. Um, so the study would take about 12 months to do. That's usually the amount of time it would take. Um, and coming out of that, a recommendation would be made whether or not to designate all or part of the study area as a heritage conservation district. And at that time, council can decide what to proceed, what to do in terms of next steps. Um, so the proposal for this study is actually to do it in house. So there's no budgetary considerations for it. Um, there is, there will be some money that needs to go towards it, but that is all, um, can all be covered under the existing heritage planning budget and economic development. Okay, thank you for that. Are there any questions for uh, Emily? Councillor O'Reilly, go ahead. 
Um, thanks very much for the report, Emily, and whatever. Um, is there going to be a, a, a fair number of opportunities for the public to, to comment, like public consultation? I read in the report they're going to have open houses and consultation, but we'll be there uh, because a lot of people won't, uh, won't really know all the details of it ever, so I'm just, uh, which, what would the schedule for, um, for public meetings be? I, it's premature at this time to give dates, but generally. Um, absolutely, yeah. So there will be, um, if council decides to initiate the study, there will be quite a number of um, areas where the public can comment. So the, in general, in pre-COVID-19 times, um, how this would normally be done is there would be three or four public meetings where uh, members of the public could come, they could ask questions, they could provide comments, um, and then they could also, one of the things that's really important for this is um, people who live in the area have more knowledge about the day-to-day -day goings on, what's important about the area to them than, for example, me, the person who'd be um, doing the study. So they, um, they would be invited to provide input on what they think is important about their area, some of the historic things they think are important. So usually we would do that at open houses. Um, there would also be things like online and paper surveys that people could do. Um, and then for some of our key stakeholders, so in this particular area, that would be people like Parks Canada, um, the Catholic School Board, the Catholic Diocese because of uh, St. Mary's, which is in the middle of it, um, as well as the Lindsay BIA. Um, we would do individual stakeholder meetings with them as well. Um, so at the moment, one of the things I'm working on um, in, and I think this is something a lot of people who do uh, planning and also heritage planning throughout the province are trying to do, is figure out how to shift that um, into a combination of virtual engagement and what kind of things maybe going forward we can do in person. Um, the public consultation for this probably wouldn't end up starting until the end of the summer because there would be, have to be some building blocks put in place first, so all that preliminary material would have to be done. Um, but definitely a key part of the study is doing that public engagement so that people can have their questions answered and provide a lot of input. Um, Emily, wh why, why, such a, why such a big area? What's the rationale for looking at a study area of this size rather than just, you know, picking a few unique buildings and structures like we've done in the past, uh, you know, and bringing them forward for consideration? What's, what's the idea with looking at a whole area? And I know there was a proposal for an even larger area. Um, what, what's the rationale for that as opposed to just doing them on a, on a one-off or, or a couple in a row type of thing? So one thing that doing the study of the, the area as a whole allows us to do is to identify specific landscape features and also the overall feel of the area. So heritage conservation districts in general are, um, if you think of an, a heritage conservation district is something that's important because of the sum of its parts. So while there are some very important individual buildings in there, including some that are already individually designated, together they form an important historical landscape. Um, so if you, um, if you look at downtown Lindsay, for example, which is our other conservation district in Lindsay, um, while there's important buildings on the street, the whole thing forms this very important um, commercial uh, streetscape, both on Kent Street and then on the streets that come off it as well. So that would, that's the justification for doing a district as, as a whole. Um, this particular area is very large. Um, the reason, there's two reasons actually why it's sort of the size it is. One is that this is the area that was originally requested by, um, by the deputation in May 2018 to do the conservation district study. Um, and historically, this formed the bottom quarter of the Purdy land grant. And this is where a lot of the original settlement in Lindsay um, took place. While the area seems large, I think in, in driving and walking around the area, it's probably unlikely to, that a future district would be this large, but doing a slightly larger area than probably the, the end district will be, means that the study is, is fulsome, it takes into consideration everything, and it's a lot easier to reduce boundaries when you um, designate an area than to suddenly find you're halfway through a study and realize that the study area is too small. Thank you, that actually makes sense. Um, I'll, Councillor Ashmore, you have a question? Councillor Ashmore is our, our council rep on the Heritage Committee, so go ahead. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Um, you had asked the one question about why it's, to Emily there, why it's a, not on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, but you answered it, thanks. My other question is, did, uh, though the deputation was in early 2018, but did they actually send a survey out to the people in that section of Lindsay? Did they send an actual questionnaire to them, whether they were really interested in, in participating in the study or becoming a historical, historically designated area? 
What was there a demand yes, for? So, like, yeah. Yes, there is. So what happened is that originally, um, I believe there were a couple of people who um, who had invo been involved in the downtown Lindsay Conservation District study. Um, and the consultant who had done that had mentioned that this area was should probably also be considered for a study. Um, so the deputant who made that presentation in 2018 did go around to members of the community and got people to sign a sheet saying, yes, I would be happy to have this as part of a conservation district. Um, and he in particular has done a lot of work in getting that community support. So we do know the community support is there. Not everybody in that area has been engaged so far, um, but we do know there are enough people in that area who want to at least have a look um, that it does seem warranted to get the study going. Um, once the study is initiated, there will be much more um, fulsome uh, community consultation so that everybody who lives there at least has the opportunity to engage um, and we'll know what they think about it. Thanks, and just one more question. Um, I know we didn't talk about it at the committee level, but is there any, any plan of a putting together a business plan? Once we get, if this thing gets going, like, is there a business plan in the future that might be put together as this gets bigger? Because, you know, it could morph into something a little bigger, but as I know it's the cost, you said the costs were within the department, like there's no external costs needed or funding needed to, to do this study right now? That's right. So the goal is to do this, um, this study and any resultant policy changes and there would be a, a district plan after this if council were to decide to go ahead with that um, would be to do that in house at the moment um, because last year there was a dedicated heritage planning position that was put in place um, to not necessary to, to do conservation district studies but to um, to support the growth of the heritage program we have that capacity um, and we also have the capacity to support an additional district if it was designated um, so in terms of long-term costs for doing this, um, it would, the costs associated with this would be doing things like sending out notices, um, paying for a space for public meetings, um, and in turn, that would generally be the, the cost for it. Looking forward, um, you know, in five, ten years, if it was designated, um, the amount of work that would uh, result from a district like this wouldn't have any additional costs for the, for the economic development budget. Any further questions? Uh, seeing none, uh, the motion that's presented in the report is that report ED 2020-009 proposed Old Mill Heritage Conservation District study be received. That staff be authorized to proceed with a Heritage Conservation District study of the Old Mill neighborhood in Lindsay. And that the Old Mill Heritage Conservation District study area be within the boundary identified in Appendix C to this report and that this recommendation be brought forward to council for consideration at the next regular council meeting. Does anyone want to move that? Councillor Elmsley and Yo. Any further comments or questions for Emily? Call the question, all in favor? That's passed. Thank you, Emily, for your presentation. We appreciate it. And uh, we'll look forward to the study. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, we'll move down to item 612, which is a physician recruitment reserve request. Uh, Director Sutherland uh, from Human Services, is, is he available for, oh, there he is. Welcome, sir. You wanna give us a quick two minutes, a pretty straightforward report, but give us a two minute overview and we'll see what we can do. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The, uh, yes, Fourth Lakes Healthcare Initiative was successful with a recent uh, uh, physician recruitment. Uh, Dr. Allison McKay uh, began last uh, practicing last month in May 11th with the Community Health Center, and uh, the uh, request for the uh, uh, incentive funding is through the city's physician recruitment reserve, which is maintained specifically to support these uh, incentive agreements with uh, with the healthcare initiative. So the request is for uh, to access that reserve in the amount of $23,500. Okay, thank you. Question? You'll move, uh, Councillor Dunn will move the report. HS 2020-004 Physician Recruitment Reserve Request be received. Payment of up to $23,500 to the Kawartha Lakes Healthcare Initiative be authorized from the Doctor Recruitment Reserve to support a physician return of service agreement 
executed by KLHCI, and that this recommendation be brought forward to Council at the next regular Council meeting. Council Dunn, you'll move that. Seconded by Councillor Elmsley. Question? Councillor Elmsley, go ahead. Uh, just one question. With the 23.5 going back in, uh, what will the balance of that account be, please? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the balance uh, prior to the 23,500 coming out is 196,000. Uh, so following that, uh, it'd be 172,500, I believe. The 23,500 less than it was before. Any further questions for the director? Um, we have a motion on the floor. Call the question. All in favor? That's passed. Thanks, Rod. Appreciate it. Uh, next report is the 613, which is a life cycle extension program. I think Mike, Mr. Farquhar is going to join us. There he is. Hello, sir. Uh, do you want to give us a quick uh, uh, two-minute overview on your report? And we'll see if there's any questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so from the last council meeting, uh, we had a request to bring forward additional road sections uh, based on pri a priority. Uh, the, the, the last report had road sections based on priorities from the spring breakup. These additional road segments uh, were also reviewed with Public Works and deemed as uh, priorities for spot repair within the identified road sections. So the value uh, of the additional road sections we, we brought forward in this report uh, is uh, 365,000, I believe. Uh, and uh, we have a recommendation in the report if council chooses to move forward with it uh, for funding these additional road segments. We're also looking for uh, authority to utilize all the or utilize our existing contracts uh, awarded this year to be able to implement that work. Could you just repeat that last? We lose him? You just repeat that last part, Mike. We just lost you there. You're looking for authorization to do which? Within the report, there's a recommendation that would authorize staff to utilize existing contracts to be able to implement the work this year. So if council authorizes the 365 to do the extra, you're saying to utilize the current contracts you have rather than put out a second tender? Is that, is that what that means? That is correct, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Elmsley, you have a question? Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. M Mike, I uh, had sent you an email yesterday. Uh, Long Beach Road, uh, you're doing for, to the Victoria Rail Trail. The portion above that, the uh, small portion from the Victoria Rail Trail to Highway 121 is in bad shape as well. And I had asked what the additional cost would be to add that to the work that was being done down there while people were already there. Uh, you gave me an answer, but you didn't give me a cost, and I wondered if you had that, please. Uh, yes, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so the section we had identified in the report is for spot repair within that section. It's not the complete section. as. Uh, that section is proposed in the five-year plan for 2021. So what we're proposing is to do spot repairs in this section that's in the report uh, to hold it over. To complete the full section, um, as Councillor Almsley has identified, uh, we're looking at uh, a value of $198,000, um, less what we had set aside for the spot repair this year, that value would be $173,000. So uh, I guess what I'm looking for is, if you're doing spot repairs, what would it cost to do spot repairs from the rail trail to 121, not a full-blown recovery? We had set aside roughly $25,000 to do spot repairs within, within the section uh, identified in the report. Uh, outside that section, as you identified, uh, we could pro pro uh, approximately spend another 
Mr. Mayor, I make a motion that uh, while they're down there doing that, that the spot repairs would be well worthwhile doing from the rail trail to 121. Okay, so let's, so then let's, if you wanna move them out, let's do the, that report, ENG 2020-009, potential additional road segments for the 2020 life cycle program be received, that an additional 375,000, 10,000 more than what they're proposing be added to the life cycle extension program to complete additional work in 2020 as identified in table one amended to include all of Long Beach Road uh, and that the funding from the capital contingency reserve be utilized in the amount of 375,000. Does that give you clarity, Mike, on a motion to just continue with spot repairs for the, the rest of Long Beach Road? It seems to make sense. Does that give you the clarity you need to proceed with the balance of that small portion? Uh, yes, it does, Mr. Mayor. Okay, you'll move that, Councillor Elmsley. Uh, seconder, Councillor Seymour Fagan. Are there any uh, other questions? Councillor Yo, go ahead. Um, for you, does that um, give you direction to add on to existing contracts? Or do you need an additional motion for that? I, I believe what's in the recommended report allows for that. So I think uh, you might have to add that. I'm not too sure here. What I did, I would have to just uh, hear the existing or the existing motion again. Yeah, I would think, Councillor, we're just approving the budget and the add to it. How staff, if they choose to put out, you know, have to put out another tender or if they choose to add it to the existing contract. From a council perspective, I don't think that's let them figure it out and let them just get it done. We're approving the work to be done and the dollar value. So I think the report by giving this motion gives them the direction they need to make that choice. Just as long as they're not handcuffed, yep. I don't think they are, I think they're good. CAO, you agree? Thank you. Uh, any other questions regarding the motion? I'll call the question, all in favor? That's passed, thanks Mike, appreciate it, and uh, the work you did to turn that around in a short uh, short time frame. And uh, so you're, you can tell us all this work's gonna be done this year, right? And you're not going to say weather permitting? Yeah, correct, as long as we get a nice fall. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Okay, what is, Council, do you want to just keep going or do you want to take a quick break or are you good? Okay, let's take a five minute stretch uh, just to take a break and we'll come back 2.37 and we'll be back here at uh, 2.42.
Okay, we'll get back at her. Thank you. Uh, uh, report 614 is proposed amendments to the policy and code of conduct for committees, boards, and task forces. I believe we have our solicitor, Robin Carlson. There she is. Welcome, Robin. Um, do you want to give us a quick two minute overview on this uh, report and then we'll see if there's any questions? Go ahead, please. Certainly. So these are uh, Council Policies 2018-017 and 2018-019, which are the policy and the code of conduct respectively for council committees, boards, and task forces. At Appendix B and C of the report, there are track changes that I propose to amend the policy and the code of conduct. Most notably at uh, Appendix B being the policy, uh, CP 2018-17, and Section 6, uh, respecting the expulsion of a member. The proposed additions to uh, what uh, formerly was set out in the policy, provide notice uh, to a member before that member is uh, being considered for termination of um, the situation itself, an opportunity to respond directly to council. I have also um, suggested that the process of providing notice go through the clerk's department rather than through the mayor that was previously set out. It seemed like it was uh, better aligned with the formal notification process required that this matter go through the clerk's department. And uh, the amendments to the code of conduct, which is set out at Appendix C, and that is CP 2018-018, mirror those changes uh, that were made in the policy. Thank you. And this report is back because of a direction from council, right? Council a while ago asked that you bring back an amendment to these covering certain points and concerns that were brought forward. And this policy recommendation change is as a result of that. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, uh, back at um, Appendix A in the report, there is report CAO 2019-003, which recommended some changes uh, to these two policies. Um, the um, changes uh, were vetted through council and council decided through council resolution to direct the policies back uh, to myself for review. And so that is what I've done. Thank you. Are there any questions for uh, Councillor Ashmore? Go ahead. Thank you. Through you to the solicitor, it's, it's a good report. I just had a question, just a quick one about uh, volunteer appointments. I think it was policy. It was okay an elector of the city at least 18 years of age and a canadian citizen have they ever thought about uh, at least being um, a permanent resident i have many residents who are permanent residents they don't have their canadian citizenship but they want to serve on boards and task forces but because they're not a canadian citizen yet that that uh, doesn't allow them to go on any committee i'm just wondering if that's something that's um, steadfast rule that we have to have a canadian citizen or can they be a a permanent resident. I admittedly didn't uh, review the entire policy. Um, I was looking at a more narrow scope for the review, uh, but if there is interest, I can definitely take a look at that recommendation and bring a further report farther. You can do that as a follow-up if you like. I think that's actually a good, a good thought. There's no big panic, but uh, I think that's a good idea. Uh, any councillor Dunn? Sorry, Let's see you on here. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a couple of questions through you to the solicitor. Um, to start off with, can you explain the difference between will and shall? So, sorry, I didn't hear the question. Could you explain the difference between the word will and shall? I noticed in some case you struck out the word shall uh, and inserted the word will. Could you explain the difference between the two words? The, that change itself might, might have been proposed in uh, the prior version. I'm not sure that I actually touched on that. Uh, will and shall are both mandatory statements. Um, obviously, one is stronger language than the other, but there's no uh, material difference between the two. Okay, that's a good start. Um, so 
when I read the proposed amendment, um, it says uh, the, the mayor will uh, investigate the allegation and determine the, for and determine the form of, de determine the form the investigation will take. It may be in consultation uh, with the CAO <laughs> committee board or task force chair uh, complainant and the liaison de and the liaison the department. Uh, why have we um, why have we given the option there uh, not to talk to the board chair? Uh, and, and 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 the reason why I'm asking is um, in some occasions the person that is in the best uh, the best uh, seat of knowledge is, is the actual chair of a particular board and to give the mayor the option of not talking to him and just going his own way, I think, uh, might, uh, might cause or might create an opportunity not to do a full investigation. So would you explain why we've uh, uh, changed the word uh, or we put the word in may as an opposed to shall? So that was a, a prior version of the, um, of the policy the more uh, updated versions that I'm recommending are at Appendix uh, B to the report. However, um, the, the mayor, I am not recommending the mayor do uh, the investigation, but rather that it be conducted uh, through the clerk's uh, division and that the um, concern with necessitating that a certain individual such as the chair be um, uh, ask for his or her opinion could be that the allegation could be against the chairperson themselves. So really, I think what this procedure sets out is that the clerk will get an allegation. The clerk will take a look at that allegation and provide notice of that allegation to the person that is being um, suggested for termination and have that person have an ability to provide a response right to uh, counsel themselves the clerk themselves would also satisfy themselves as to the accuracy of the concern. So if it was uh, some hearsay evidence, they would probably want to speak with those other uh, individuals that had firsthand knowledge of the situation and would provide that evidence uh, both um, to counsel itself as well as uh, to the person uh, that the complaint is made against and then council would have the ability to make the decision. I understand that, but um, so, so where my issue uh, arises is uh, they may want to do a complete and thorough investigation and speak to everybody, or they may not want to do a complete and thorough investigation and not speak to the involved parties. Uh, and, you know, and I can think of it, you know, where, where there's a sworn affidavit from the chair that in fact the allegations placed forward were not in fact correct, which did not enter into part of the evidence. So what my question is, is why do we give the mayor or the investigator the opportunity to decide, mm -hmm. well, I'm just gonna go my way and, and not do a thorough and complete investigation? So the complete investigation, including the documents, would come to council. So then council would take a look at it and decide, is this investigation thorough enough uh, to support the recommendation or do we want to do we want to as the deciders of the decision as to whether or not termination should happen do we want to request additional work be done so it has to come to council for any that's correct any action further so you're just talking about the initial any initial investigation and then that recommendation comes to council and then council can choose to look into it further, direct, not the mayor, but the clerk, that's what it's been changed to, so that uh, uh, we're not involved originally till it comes to council to make a further decision. So I think you're covered. Uh, I know what you're saying, but I think, I think it's covered in there. It just gives a bit of flexibility right off the start, depending on who the allegations are against. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm not comfortable with it. Unfortunately, I, ha I haven't got better wording uh, to uh, to uh, provide, so um, uh, based on that, I'm I'm uh, I'm going to stop asking uh, I'm going to stop asking questions. But I, I will say I'm not comfortable with the format. Um, it is better than what we had, uh, but I certainly don't believe that it um, it fulfills the need. So I will stop asking questions. Okay, thank you. Any further questions regarding the report? 
So the motion that report RS 2020-007 proposed amendments to the policy and code of conduct for committees, boards and task forces be received. That the proposed amendments to CP 2018-017 and CP 2018-018 as set out in this report be adopted. And that these recommendations be forwarded to the next council agenda uh, for adoption. Does anybody want to move that? Councillor O'Reilly and Yo. Any further questions? Comments? All in favor? That's passed. Uh, thanks, Robin. Uh, Councillor Ashmore, do you want to do a follow up just uh, uh, regarding what your motion was before? Just a minor follow up, Mr. Mayor. I just thought on page 112 of 157, under volunteer appointments, that under three, it would say a permanent resident and or Canadian citizen could be, become a member of a task force. Just it says a Canadian citizen, but to also include a permanent resident of Canada. So why don't we just ask that, that this portion, this report, or this policy be again referred to the solicitor to come back with uh, some rewording regarding the uh, whatever section that was? What's Canadian, sorry. Volunteer appointments, the volunteer appointments section. Does that give you some direction, Robin? She's like, what? It does. Sorry, I turned off my mute and it took me a while to, That's okay. Uh, That's okay. to get to it. And there's no there's no big rush there, but that just gives you gives you something to review there and come back and uh, and we'll go with that. So are you comfortable with that? Um, so you'll move that, Councillor Ashmore. You'll second that, Councillor Seymour Fagan. Any discussion? All in favor? That's passed. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Robin. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, we'll move down to correspondence, which is 6.2. Uh, first memorandum is mine regarding a state of emergency. Um, that the memorandum from Mayor Latham regarding state of emergency be received, and this recommendation be brought forward to Council for consideration at the next regular Council meeting. Um, does anybody want to move that? And then I'll talk to a little bit, uh, Councillor Richardson and Yo. Um, yeah, I just, I wanted to put this on here because we, as you know, the province has extended their state of emergency to the end of the month, uh, June. Um, we have been in a local state of emergency since shortly after the province initiated theirs in March. Um, I went to our EOC, the Emergency Operations Center last last week and just talked to the group about, you know, at what point is our local emergency state or local state of emergency uh, redundant. Uh, you know, it enables us to, as the memorandum says, it enables us at the local level or, or me uh, as a mayor to implement uh, any kind of action that goes beyond what the province is doing. Uh, we can't contradict the province's order, but we could take it further. Uh, if we so choose, we haven't chose, we haven't had to do that. Um, if they choose to open up bars and restaurants on Friday, um, under our local state of emergency, we could choose to put that off for another week or put another date on that locally. So we couldn't open it without them opening it, but we could, we could choose to keep it in place longer. I'm certainly not recommending that. So, um, don't misunderstand me, but what I really wanted to do was when, when we took it to the EOC, they were one of the big concerns that came forward because at some point I would like to lift our local state of emergency. We're still in a provincial state of emergency. So technically, you know, we're part of the province. Um, but when I took it to our emergency operations center, they were very concerned unanimously um, about the mixed message that we're sending to the community. Um, you know, we're still under, are we, are people gonna get confused? Or can they, de do most people determine between a local state of emergency and a provincial state of emergency? Um, you know, so, it's really just, you know, are we at that point where locally, you know, we're, we're still under the province, can we start easing, easing up on our local state of emergency or do you feel strongly as the emergency operations center does that we should keep that message consistent with the province? And I just, I saw this as an opportunity to get some feedback from, from council as opposed to, you know, our staff and, and the health unit and the hospital and such like that. So um, I'm really just looking for your opinion and your thoughts on, uh, on how you think the best way moving forward. Now that we're into phase two as of Friday, um, you know, that was kind of one of the triggers in my mind once we got to the phase two opening, perhaps where, you know, we can, we can get out of our local state. 
but I am concerned that you know some of the public will go, hey, we're done, we're over, and, and, and all of a sudden we get ourselves in trouble again. But uh, Councillor Almsley, go ahead. Yeah, I think it's I think it's wise to keep it in place as long as the the province keeps it in place. Um, it, there there is no downside to not doing it. Uh, there is a downside to stopping it because, as you say, it sends a mixed message, and people are already confused enough about what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do because some of the wording of some of the things are ambiguous. And, and as you know, we get questions all the time about what's allowed and what's not allowed, even though we may think it's clear, other people don't. So I, I think keeping it there uh, in sync with the province makes a lot of sense and we should continue to do it. I appreciate that, thank you. Councillor Ashmore? Um, I disagree, previous speaker. I, I think that from this whole beginning, there were two things we had to do, flatten the curve and, and have ample hospital capacity, and we did that both. We did that very well. So those two things were done. If you continue the lockdown, not only are you suppressing businesses and some people are essential, some people are non-essential, just, it just aggravates things and causing mental health issues as well as, as economic issues. I mean, we get to a point where maybe businesses can't even rebound. I know we have our task forces and, and they're gonna do their best to try and re, to rejuvenate the economy, but uh, you know, I, I've been getting, personally myself, you know, I, I hear conflicting medical uh, advice and uh, some of the modeling's been wrong, if not all of it. Uh, even yesterday, they're saying asymptomatic people cannot catch COVID-19 and it just gives a confusing, even from the so-called health authorities, uh, world health authorities and local health authorities, I'm getting so many confusing um, medical advice and I think it's time that we, like I said before, this was to be a three week thing, now it's evolved into three months. What's gonna happen, we're gonna extend it to July 31st and it's gonna keep going on and on. I think, it's, I think we need the ability to, to set our own uh, deadline on this uh, state of emergency. Okay, I appreciate that. I just, just, for, just for clarity, we're, you know, businesses aren't closed because of anything we've done with our local state of emergency. I could lift local state, I could lift our state of emergency right now and nothing changes, right? The only thing, nothing changes. So as far as lockdown and any provincial orders, those are all coming from the province. It's so we have no local orders in place whatsoever. So That's, I just, I just want to make sure that you're understanding. That I understand, you're right. 100%. I'm not disagreeing with you that, you know, we need to open up and we need to get going. But uh, at the same time, that's not something we have control over on the local level. So that's why I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking for some, some opinions. And I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I just want to make sure you're clear on that. Oh, you're right. It's provincial. Thanks. It's provincial, yeah. Which, uh, Councillor Yo? Yeah, thank you. And through you, I agree um, with Councillor Elmsley. And I think we should just mirror what the province is doing for the simplicity of it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Riley. Yeah, just just along the, uh, I appreciate both speakers' opinions, uh, but I think that if anything was to come out after this, and at least if we're consistent, and if something, we had an outbreak, which could, we don't want to say that we're going to have one, but at least, uh, and we were a result of something spreading out of our community, I think it's better to err on the side of caution and just follow the provincial rules. Thank you. Anyone else? Councillor Seymour Fagan? I want to hear from everybody. You're not hiding on this one. Go ahead. Now, um, believe it or not, I think that we should follow the province right now. Um, they got a, a set of some hot water earlier, so right now I, th I think it's a good idea because people are very confused. We're confused when we get okay. uh, Thank you. the questions. Yeah. Yep. Councillor Vail? I was just going to say the same thing. As, as much as I'd like to see us lift it, uh, I think there's already too much confusion out there. I, I think for simplicity, we just need to stay the course. I appreciate that. Councillor Richardson. Thank you. And I'm in agreement too, because of the simplicity of the whole, you know, environment that we're in. And I just think it's less conflicting messages out there. And I think we stay the course as well. Thank you. Councillor Dunn. Yeah, I had lots of time to think on this one. Uh, yeah, th there's, there's no advantage to having a uh, citywide state of emergency, unless we have an issue. 
that's not covered by the provincial state of emergency. So if in fact we had an outbreak in, God forbid, Bob Cajun again, but where some sort of remedial action for Bob Cajun may be necessary, and I only say that because that's where we got our first major outbreak, uh, where some remedial act specifically for Bob Cajun may be necessary, then we can act without affecting the rest of the city and without getting the province to come on board. So for those reasons, um, I have no issue with continuing the state of emergency. Uh, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't have any impact, but I also believe that um, if we say there's no longer a state of emergency in the city of Kawartha Lakes, and the province says there is a state of emergency in the province, then we're sending out mixed signals. So I, I think uh, I, I think we got to stay the course. Agree. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, the motion's just received. We have it on the floor. All in favor? That's passed. And uh, thank you for your input. Uh, Six two two is a memorandum from regarding the review of delegation of authority bylaw from Councillor Ashmore that the memorandum from Councillor Ashmore regarding bylaw 2020-033 be received, that council rescind bylaw 2020-033, and that this recommendation be brought forward to council for consideration at the next regular council meeting. Uh, you'll move that, Councillor Ashmore? A second. Councillor Dunn? Yep. Do you want to speak to it, Councillor? Um, well, I'll, right now I'll just, I'll in my sum up, I'll say it, but right now I think it's self-explanatory. Okay, Councillor Dunn, you second? No, Councillor Yo, you have a question? Uh, not so much a question as a comment. Um, I'm gonna speak against the motion. This is typically the time of year that we actually give the CAO our authority to, because we slow down the summertime usually. I don't see us speeding up this summer. And in fact, uh, there could be uh, fluid situations that require immediate attention that I don't think, uh, such as planning issues and stuff, that I don't think we want to wait a full month or two to get decisions through. And in light of that, I think um, we should keep this uh, delegation in place until uh, at least, I'm thinking at least the fall as would normally be in uh, any other year. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Almsley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I agree with uh, Councillor Yo. Uh, was the point I was going to make was we're in the summer season and we normally delegate authority to uh, the CAO. I also think the fact that uh, it coincides with being in a state of emergency um, uh, says that we should probably keep it there and do everything at once. So if anything, I see the, uh, this motion, this uh, memorandum as being premature. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Councillor O'Reilly? Maybe through, through you to, uh, to Ron. If there's any major crisis or major decision comes, uh, would it not uh, come to the attention of council anyways? CAO. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So we'll leverage any of the meetings that are scheduled, obviously, and where possible, we, we're always reporting to you. I think we've already set that tone monthly, uh, even during the height of the pandemic. Um, so we would continue that practice um, regardless of delegated authority or not. Um, it just means that in some circumstances, you may need to make certain decisions that aren't delegated uh, over the summer months, and that's really uh, your your uh, option. Interesting, interesting conversation. Because I was, you know, I, I was almost going to put a memo in something similar myself, you know, and and Councillor Ashmore said so. I, was, you know, we're now back to some regular council meetings, but then, you know, you're making good points that they're, you know, that we're still in a state of emergency and and having a little bit of flexibility there. Can I ask uh, CAO what, to date, what are there any, what has been, what authority have you used under that delegation of authority since we put it in place? Is there anything that, that jumps out? I know it's been very minimal. Most things have been shut down, but I know I'm putting you on the spot, but is there, is there anything that you can, I, that, that's been utilized uh, or from, from when we gave you that delegation? 
uh, to you, Mr. Mayor, certainly expediting some procurement decisions, and so we will do that in the context of budgets, but where there's maybe been irregular activities, uh, like less than three bids or so on, um, I would have that authority to approve those and then report back to council after the fact. Um, we haven't had to leverage any delegation with respect to uh, any real estate transactions formally at this point. Um, it's really more, quite honestly, just, and it's a bit gray, but it's sort of making those service decisions in the immediate term and uh, the service levels. And, uh, you know, I'm interpreting them or trying to work within the context of budgets, but uh, I would say that's probably the number one area where it's been regular and weekly decisions uh, that we've had to make. We talked a little bit about some decisions, even on cash flow and, you know, some of that delegated authority ultimately to manage the business week to week. Uh, those are decisions that either I've had to make or support uh, with delegated authority of staff. So that would have been what I've utilized um, over this pandemic to date. So continuing with the delegation of authority, would it, would it give, like when we talk about economic recovery and, you know, some of the things we want to do in a hurry over the summer to, you know, waive a policy or, or, a do or change a policy to, you know, just to get things moving and get people back to work, which is, I think, what we're all in agreement with. Does that delegation of authority give you a little bit of flexibility for something? I don't know what. I have nothing in mind that, that might come forward that you would possibly be able to sign off on as opposed to having to adjust a policy or, 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 or in that format? Would it give us a little bit of flexibility over the summer uh, if it was to continue? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, it probably gives a little bit of flexibility. I wouldn't suggest that it's a dramatic amount, to be quite honest. Um, we'll report through to council. Um, some cases, though, um, again, it does provide some flexibility, and I think the, we discussed even the fact that there's only two council meetings in the summer, and so now that we're getting into some of the recovery phase, there probably would be some flexibility to expedite certain services. Uh, but beyond that, I think in terms of major fundamental decisions, like appointing certain officials or officers was another delegated authority. Uh, very fortunately, we didn't have to do that, and we're probably past that stage uh, in the threat of the recovery, so. Thank you. Any further questions? If not, I'll ask Councillor Ashmore to sum up. Uh, go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this memo, I put it together. First of all, I, I want to thank the CAO. He's an excellent CAO and he'll always be an excellent CAO prior and during this pandemic and afterwards. But we proved to ourselves, just going back right after this whole thing started in March, that uh, things were kind of hairy for a few days. We didn't know how we could communicate with each other. But we've proven that we've been able to meet electronically uh, over the last month and a half, two months, and now we're here in person, we're meeting in this building. So we're, we're able to function, we're able to, to do business, we're able to, to conduct meetings. And I think the most important thing is that we have to restore 100% of the authority back to the elected representatives, the mayor, the head of council, and council. There's nine of us around this table that are elected representatives and we should have 100% of the power. I just think that the time has come that we have to be uh, fully in charge, 100%. Thank you for that. I'll call the question. Everybody's clear on the motion? Uh, call the question, all in favor? Motion fails. Can I just get a motion then that the memorandum uh, regarding review of delegation authority bylaw uh, from Councillor Ashmore be received. Councillor Dunn and, and Elmsley, call the question, all in favor? Well, that's passed, thank you. Um, we'll move down to 623, which is a memorandum regarding the signage volunteer emergency lights uh, brought forward by Councillor Dunn. Uh, the memorandum from Councillor Dunn regarding signage for volunteer lights be received, that staff provide options to council for the placement of pullover and stop for flashing green light signs at various vantage points throughout the city and that these options be included as a decision unit in the 2021 budget, and these recommendations be brought forward to council for consideration at the next regular council meeting. Is that still the motion you want to put forward? Councillor Dunn, you'll move that. Seconded by Councillor Almsley. Go ahead. Sorry, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and I will give you some, um, some quick, uh, quick background. Uh, I've had conversations with the chief. 
Um, he's indicated to me that uh, this is, would not be one of his preferred uh, uh, avenues of, of that. And he gave me some very, very good arguments. I tend to disagree with them, but uh, he did give some very good arguments. This motion um, uh, has been initiated by my contact with volunteer firefighters. Um, and this gives staff an opportunity to, pre to present their position as to um, why they support or don't support it. And um, I, I, I believe that the cost is minimal. It's a half a dozen signs. I still think it's a good idea, but it will give the uh, chief an opportunity to, pre to present his argument to, uh, to council. I ask you to support the motion. Councillor Almsley, you want to speak to it? Just briefly, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, I've been a proponent of this for some time, and uh, I could not understand why it existed in many other municipalities, and yet we didn't have it, because I, I think it uh, makes a lot of sense that uh, you get out of the way of people who are trying to get to uh, fire station in order to go and respond to an emergency. So I, I just think it makes eminent sense. Yeah, I, I will pass on because you're right. The chief responded and copied me on it as well. And, and one of his concerns was that this has been brought up to the union and the union has dealt with it and they're satisfied it's not a requirement. So that's the volunteer fire union. Uh, it was brought forward. Now that obviously is not mean everybody in the union agrees with that proposal and I think this guy but as far as this is coming back you know like you said the chief will have he can't make I don't think he's on today is he Kathy he couldn't he had a personal thing he had to deal with but uh, you know I think this gives us the option to it'll come back and the chief can put an accompanying report with it on on the other side of of why he doesn't think it's necessary and then we can make an informed decision at that time so uh, Councillor Richardson go ahead Exactly. That was what I was going to ask you. I was just want to hear the arguments against because, uh, I mean, I've seen firsthand not long ago when uh, the green lights and people were not respecting that. And I was frustrated watching it. So I'd be interested to hear back from Chief Pankers. Yeah. And I think, I think Councillor Dunn's memo gives that, gives us that opportunity before we make any final decision. Councillor Seymour Fagan. Yes, thank you. I want to thank Councillor Dunn for this because I've brought this up several times in Council, including at the last budget meeting, and I was told that they would do a communications um, effort this year. Well, we're six months in and there's no communications effort, so I guess it has to come to a memo. So thank you very much, Councillor Dunn, for this one. Thank you. Any further questions, comments? You want to sum up? Pretty good. I'll call the question. All in favor? That's passed. Thank you. Um, 624 is a memorandum regarding the extension of Angeline Street North Sidewalk, again by Councillor Dunn, that it be received. The staff prepare a report with recommendations to extend the sidewalk on Angeline Street North from Alcorn Drive to the north entrance of Springdale Garden Drive, that the extension of the sidewalk session be included in the 2021 budget as a decision unit, and that that recommendation be brought forward to Council. Is that what you'll move? Move it. Seconder? Councillor Elmsley, you want to speak to it? Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to get on the list. Uh, we have a we have an annual budget for uh, for sidewalks. I just want to give uh, one a little poke and say this is the one I want to look at. That's all. Councillor Elmsley, just when I, when I drive that area going home or or uh, yeah, usually going home, I notice where the sidewalk ends, and I sometimes see people walking, and they're kind of forced out in the road and. Uh, I know there are uh, quite a few residents up there and it's probably a safety thing and I think it's a good idea. Yeah, and I have no problem with the memo. I know I've had concerns from some residents in that area. I know I did talk to the director at one point about it and there is, as part of the build out in the north part of the town, there is a plan for a sidewalk. I just don't know quite where it fits in the overall plan, but I think your memo that staff prepare a report to come back will give us all that information before a budget decision is made. So. I have no problem supporting the memo. Go ahead, you want to sum up? Yeah, I had a talk to Juan about, or to the director about it, and um, uh, he wanted to wait until the new subdivision was built, uh, and that was, and at that time he was saying that's about an 11-year build-out. I, I don't want to wait 11 years, that's all. Fair enough. Okay, we'll call the question. All in favor? That's passed, thank you. Uh, 625 is a memorandum regarding the regulatory considerations for managing cannabis growth in the city of Kawartha Lakes. 
uh, memorandum from Councillor Richardson that it be received. The staff be directed to provide information and options for zoning bylaw regulations for both personal medical, personal medical and commercial growth operations. And that staff be directed to provide information options for enforcement measures when commercial and personal medical growth operations exceed federal approvals or when the impact of the operation exceeds lot coverage percentages and post-production processing brings a commercial element to otherwise residential or farm dwellings. That staff report back to council with their proposals by the end of Q3 2020 and that these recommendations be brought forward to council. Um, your memo, will you move that recommendation? Yes. You will, and count seconded by Councillor Vale. Thank you. Do you wanna to speak to it? Go ahead. I will, thank you. Um, just one of the main obvious reasons that I'm pushing this right now is um, I, I do have one that's being constructed in my ward and I've had um, quite a few numerous other inquiries recently. And, and the individuals purchasing the same land are not the, the primary residents either. And, it, it's, and neighborhoods are becoming uh, very concerned regarding public safety. I've spoke to planning department and they're having roughly two to three inquiries daily regarding this type of operation. So following the legalization of cannabis, we've seen unprecedented uh, growth with this industry. Health Canada issues these permits unbeknownst to the municipality where they're going to crop up. Um, so there's a bit of a loophole in these permits. So for example, if they get four approved Health Canada certificates, that's a total of 1,800 plants for indoor or 700 for outdoor greenhouses for, um, for uh, processing. Licensing might take outdoor or indoor or allow for both. Amounts can change based on live or processed plants. So it's a moving target, which is something that we need to address. Currently, we don't have a comprehensive set of guidelines in place that would allow us to determine whether or not individuals or corporations are operating within the confines of the federal and provincial legislation, nor do they have a clear stance on how we are regulating these operations within our municipality. So there's a lot of other moving parts that we have to consider, um, incorporating the evaluation of processing operation, how it will actually impact our local ecosystems, which is chemical runoff, uh, waste management, uh, light pollution, and do we have a bylaw in place to monitor the, this public nuisance odors or lighting due to cultivation? Another question should be, should we develop an interim bylaw to aid in both planning approvals and in regulation until the rural zoning, zoning bylaw review has been completed? Basically, we're the gateway off the 407. So they're coming north because the land, agricultural land is a lot cheaper than going south. Um, we're gonna see an influx for sure. Uh, like I said, they're seeing two to three inquiries daily about this. So it's about regulating the property use properly. It's about the public nuisance sector. And most importantly, it's about public safety because there's going to be enforcement issues. So right now I'm bringing this memo to us today to have city staff get back to us about some recommendations and I'm looking for your support today. Well, well done. Certainly got my support. I'm not going to argue with that argument. Councillor Vale, do you want to uh, speak to it? You seconded it? Um, sure. Tracy's covered everything. Um, I just think it's important, uh, and she's absolutely right. This is, It's not just her ward. They're cropping up all over in, in all our wards and all over the city, right? And, and, and it is. There's a huge uh, gray area as to how to manage these or whatever, and I, I just think it uh, behooves us to... Um, make a solution that fits our community rather than waiting for somebody else to, to dictate it to us. Agree, thanks. Councillor Seymour Fay? Yes, thanks Tracy for this motion because um, I'm on the OPP board and they have brought this up before that people can gang together their um, licenses from Health Canada and they have these huge grow ops. And, and they are, they're all over, so it's not just that area. And, and the OPP can't enforce any any of it, so this will give them some teeth as well, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ashmore. I agree with the motion, thank you, uh, Councillor Richardson. Uh, we have one very large one, just, well, not far from me, I'll just say that, that's growing and growing. But what kind of uh, disturbs me is that you have some micro facilities that, that are actually going through the pre-consultation. They have to go through the, the hoops, and yet the big ones, they can just, multiply so they don't have to go through as many hoops as the smaller ones which really isn't right so 
but hopefully this will this will rectify that. Yeah, I think it'll bring us back some options. I mean, they, the big ones get a federal license, right? And they don't have to get our approval to do it. Uh, kind of reminds you of the Green Energy Act when they were going ahead with that before we got our, got our head around that. But uh, uh, I think it's a good memo and I think it'll get some information back and then we can make a decision from there. So thanks for, uh, thanks for bringing that forward. Any other questions, comments on? Call the question, all in favor? It's passed, thank you. Uh, 626 is a memorandum regarding the 2020 Community Partnership Fund uh, from Councillor Yo that it be received that the 2020 Community Partnership Fund and other community funding programs be referred to the Community Recovery Task Force with options for the remainder of 2020 and 2021 program and that these recommendations be brought forward to Council. Councillor Yo, you'll move that. Thank you, seconded by Councillor O'Reilly. Uh, Councillor Yo, do you wanna to speak to it? Yeah, thank you. I um, just want to start by saying I'm perhaps going to get Tracy to write the rest of my memos for me. <laughs> but this one was pretty easy to write. A um, lot, uh, lot of groups and, and people who get funding from us on a 50-50 basis, of course, this year are having a very difficult time fundraising and, and, and raising that 50%. So I'm looking to uh, get this forwarded to the Recovery Task Force, and I thank the Mayor for that suggestion and uh, have them look at it and at how we can help those groups by maybe not charge by maybe not requiring them to pay back the full amount and maybe taking what's left in this year's program and uh, maybe next year uh, doing even bigger 50 50 partnerships that maybe it's a 60 40 70 30 something like along those lines so so um i hope you'll support this and and give our local groups and uh community groups a, a, a hand up thank you Thank you. Councillor Elmsley. Councillor O'Reilly, did you second it? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, that's okay. No, I just supported um, Emmett has stated the facts and, uh, and um, we'll hope to come back with some uh, suggestions, ideas from the Recovery Task Force and happy to support it. Thank you. Councillor Elmsley. Yeah. Uh, a couple of things on that. Um, while I'm in general agreement, um, will there still be uh, staff look at the uh, applications and they have a criteria for judging them <coughs> <coughs> excuse me is that criteria still going to remain in place or will the task force have its own criteria no I think I think the memo and Councillor Yo can speak to it is is just to send the information to the task force to review and if they have recommendations on changing those terms or those conditions or the way the grant is held out because of the difficult times that we're in, then that's, that's what they're looking forward to coming back and, and council can make decisions at that time. So uh, I, I think that's what you had in mind when, when you brought it forward, not for the task force to make those changes, but to make recommendations back to council to how can we do it a little differently in, in these times. Okay, and uh, I don't know if you'd like to do, if you'd like me to do it as a follow-up motion, but I would like to uh, add one hundred thousand dollars this year to those programs uh, to give the task force uh, additional funding that they may need in order to support community programs <laughs> we don't i mean we've already passed our budget for 2020 so I, i'm not sure what your i it might be a recommendation that when this is reviewed comes back from the task force to change the terms and if they want to add to it for next year or you know because a lot of it's already been allocated for this year some of it's already been allocated so there's really only a certain balance left i think that information i think you're jumping the gun a little bit but um i i like your well i don't like i don't like your i like your initiative but sort of except for the hundred thousand dollar part uh well i w i have a funding source for it have a funding source. I bet you do. Uh, CEO, you were you were going to comment there. You just about fell out of your chair. So I assume you have something you want to say. Uh, no, but through you, Mr. Mayor, I, I think it's a good conversation at the task force, and I think both ta task forces are looking at a number of recommendations. If we, if you need staff support or guidance, sort of on those other funding programs, I think the idea would be to. Uh, make recommendations, bring them forward to the subsequent council meeting, and then we would look at um, offering a funding source potentially, although it sounds like you found one in this case, so that's good. 
So no, I mean, I, you, can, you can put whatever follow-up motion you wanna put forward. I'm just suggesting it might be a better recommendation coming back from the task force and then let council deal with it when we have to see what it is you're proposing to do with it. Sort of have the whole package together. Because the economic, well, recovery, I, uh, the economic yeah. recovery task force is gonna be looking at some ideas as well. So your source of funding might be partially spoken for uh, moving forward. Oh, but, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I was only doing it now because I was thinking there, I believe there's still money left in the 50-50 and the application date is due the end of July. And, and I think there may be one or two other uh, ones out there where there's uh, an opportunity for uh, groups to apply. And I was just trying to augment those because I thought in order to hit the ground running that the task force is having um, a little more resources at their fingertips may be able to make faster and better decisions. And I'm not disagreeing with what, what you're saying. I just, I really think that to Councillor Yeo's point and his intention for the memo, there's a lot of groups struggling this year, volunteer wise, meeting wise, their capacity to put programs together is probably not what it could be. And that might be a better, have a better impact next year when they've got more time to, you know, whether we can put more money into the fund or whether we can loosen their contribution, you know, lower their contribution portion of it, but almost giving them time to say, this is gonna be a year of, you know, a lot of lost events and a lot of lost things done in the community, unfortunately. Uh, and it just might have a bigger impact next year when people sort of get in the fall to gear up for what's going on next year. But um, if you wanna do a follow-up motion, feel free, but I would, recommend that you bring back a recommendation through the task force let the whole group have a conversation about that because they might uh, they might disagree with what I'm saying but okay yeah I would I think it's it's a good point and, and it certainly if not for this year then it might be something we look at for next year how do we how do we double up on that uh, grant funding or, or that proposal um, any other questions on the memo comments on the memo call the question all in favor that's passed, thank you. Um, 627 is the request for the removal of no parking signs on Westwood Court in Lindsay. With the March 5th, 2020 correspondence from Randy Cowell and Faye Cowell regarding a request for the removal of no parking signs on Westwood Court, Lindsay be received and referred to staff for review and a report back at the July 28th, 2020 council meeting and that this recommendation be brought forward to council um, Aaron, we discussed it by he's fine with that. He'll just bring back what he, what his recommendations are. You'll move that, Councillor Dunn? Okay, got a seconder. Councillor O'Reilly, do you wanna to speak to it? Yeah, just very briefly, I've talked to Aaron. Uh, just about everybody on the street, it's a small court. Uh, I, I was looking at the number of names and counting the number of houses. I think we got the entire population on that side of the road. Um, we have no idea why they had no parking there. Uh, and Aaron has no reason to want to no parking there. So anyway, I've talked to him, thank you. And this is a pretty quick turnaround, so I think for July that'll work. Um, call the question, all in favor? That's passed, thank you. Uh, we have no closed session, so a motion to adjourn, please. Councillor Yo. seconded by Councillor Vail. All in favor? That's passed. Next meeting will be regular council meeting on June 23rd here in council chambers. Thank you, have a great day.